Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Black Prism Groups podcast, um, Black Liberation Through Literacy. It's great. Every time I hear that introduction, I feel like I should just grab the mic. I shouldn't just let it be off camera. <laughs> <laughs> How's it going, Kamar? Peace, Hatcher. How you been? How's your week? Well, it's been good. It's been good. You know, a um, lot of conversation with a lot of teachers who are winding down the school year. So, you know, just everybody's feeling pretty good. Waiting to get back next August, see what happens. Yeah, it's about that time. I mean, you're out of high school, so um, young adults are starting their adulthood, right? And they're graduating. I know that you celebrated uh, another personal, you know, child yeah. going to going to college. So that's something to be celebrated. You know, I'm in middle school, so we call it promotion. Uh, but to that end, you know, it just hit me that this has been a year like no other year in the history of education. Um, and we're done with it, right? So there's always, for me, this kind of uh, moment of release at the end of the school year. Um, and to that end, just thinking about how complicated this school year has been, any thoughts from you around what this year in particular might mean to you out of the uh, 25 plus that you've been in education? <laughs> All of them. Uh, you know, what's interesting to me about this year is I'm waiting. In a few years, we're going to start getting the data about what the impact of this time is. I mean, I don't know when we'll get the data next year, but, you know, researchers are already salivating. Like there's just so much stuff to be culled from what's happened. I'm hypothesizing that what we're going to see is not much has changed. And it's going to make us question how we educate young people. Because, you know, I mean, I don't know that we were doing all that great a job before. And this might just out some of that. That's just my hypothesis. Yeah, I, I want to see the data to find out if that's true. It's funny. You know, um, it was a term kind of early in the pandemic that was going around. Um, we got to make up for learning loss. And I think the community then pushed back and said, wait a minute, learning loss. Well, if we look at the data, right, yeah. uh, only 20 yeah. percent of students that were black in your district was able to read. Right. And so they were they begin to say, how can you lose something that you never ha had? And, and I just recently heard, uh, I guess, a rebut the way that the discord changes is that, uh, you know, pandemic learning. Right. So they're not calling it learning loss anymore, but pandemic learning. Uh, no. But I, I think you bring up a salient point uh, around what is the data going to bear out? Um, were students better off at home? whether it was a net gain, was there a change? Um, how does that look? So I'd be interested to see that as well. In particular, for me working at a middle school, um, we're, we're very interested in the sixth graders who came in for their first experience being away from the school site, how that might look. Yeah, yeah. it's interesting. I, I mean, this is kind of tangential, but the, the, the way that we measure the outcomes for school are kind of wonky to me, right? Like really what we should measure school and how many people get jobs, how many start their own businesses, how many people are happy, how many people go to the military, but we make it on, oh, they graduated, right? Like, and what happened after that? Right. And we don't track any data 10 years down the road. Like the kids who graduated this year, what are they doing a year from now? We don't know. We don't know. We don't have a clue. So I'm just wondering when all this data starts to come out, will anything be different? Will anything mm -hmm. be different? Right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, and that's, yeah, that's an interesting point. The whole yeah, pandemic education or whatever it's called. That's crazy. That's all right. Crazy. You ready to get into this week's show? Always. 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 <laughs> so we left we left the last show thinking about how do we frame uh, the third part of this series, uh, the concluding part of this this series, um, thinking about what are some things that we can do uh, for this sub game. Right. We've been talking about the sub game in terms of what are some things that we can actualize on our own uh, to compete, uh, to fight back uh, and to build the systems and structures that we need to for our students to become literate and by literate, meaning uh, more closer to liberation. Uh, and you and I begin to talk about something we wanted to address, and we're trying to figure out how to do that in the series uh, around these kind of three concentric circles of influence, uh, microsystems, mesosystems, and exosystems. Right. Um, you do a great job of, of, of framing and taking broad concepts, right, and, and making them real and plausible for us. Can you talk a little bit about perhaps what those spheres of influence look like and maybe how we might frame that in a conversation around some things we can do at home? some things we can do within a school structure and some things we might need to do outside of the community uh, as topic or a progression of our conversation uh, for this right. evening. So, I mean, this came out of developmental psychology, I think, but it was just like, what are the impacts in a, in a young person's life? And the first one, the microsystem is all the things that happen in the home, just the home, right? What the parents do, what the sisters and brothers do, all the things that impact a child in the home. And then we get into the mesosystem, which is basically the interaction the student has directly with other adults. So school is a major influence in the mesosystem. It's kids go into the mesosystem and teachers have an influence on them. And at some level, teachers have an influence on the home, right? Teachers in homework, teachers talk to parents. And then there's like the exosystem, which is outside of both of those. And so those are things that 
the kids might interact with, but don't have a direct impact on the student like that, like the local grocery store um, or a little bit broader would be like political economy, but that's not actually the exo system. That's another system that we don't want to get into today. <laughs> but uh, um, but it's just where these things impact the student or a child and in the, in their development. And it's important to start to think about what relationship these things have with the student. And so when we say micro system, we're talking about things that are really intimate with the child. And when we say meso system, they're kind of intimate, right? I mean, a teacher has a certain amount of influence and access to your child that other people don't. And then when we get to the exo system, those are the people we kind of arms link. Like, hey, yeah, it's good for you to, inter but we don't want you interacting like that. Mm -hmm. Like the guy who tried to rub my child at the grocery store. They're so cute. Whoa, back up, buddy. Like, yeah. You're way too close. Way too close. <laughs> way too close. Well, that, that makes me think about something. Um, you know, before we we have a show or anytime I have to speak or anytime I'll be in the public thinking about education and particularly being asked to speak about education from a perspective of uh, black folks, I'm always making sure that I'm going back and I'm talking to the elders, right? So leading up to that, I am literally talking to the elders and ancestors and saying, give me the words to say, guide my thoughts and my actions so that they are, are worthy of a conversation. I take the burden of responsibility hmm. very seriously. And part of that due diligence is always picking up a couple books and a couple texts, right, uh, that have been documented. And I've been reading this uh, throughout the, the school year. It's, uh, it's called Awakening the Natural Genius of Black Children by uh, our beloved brother uh, Amos Wilson, okay. right? And so there's a, there's a cover for folks that want to want to check it out. Uh, but in it, he has this quote, and I've read this quote before, but I think before we bring in our, our panelists and our guests, uh, well, it's not really a panelist, before we bring in our family, right, our our uh, Black Prism Group family uh, this evening, and I just wanted to maybe set the tone with this before we uh, bring folks in and by way of introduction. And it says, um, at the beginning of one of the chapters, I think it's right before the introduction, uh, Brother Wilson says, uh, what the family talks about in the evening, the child will talk about in the morning. Right. So what the family talks about in the evening, the child will talk about in the morning. And so as we begin to bring um, our family, our Black Prism Group family in for this first part of our conversation, I want us to maybe reflect on that as a guiding point for us to begin this conversation. What are those things that we need to do at home? What are the conversations we need to have to push our, our children and i.e. our students as well, right, closer towards liberation and being more literate towards the end goals of what we've been talking about, risk assessment, uh, decision making uh, and happiness. Um, so, without further ado, you want to you want to bring in the team, and maybe we can start with uh, introduction of our subject matter expert, who has been here for uh, the two previous ex uh, episodes, <laughs> and will be here for for tonight. And then I'll I'll come in with um, some folks who have been uh, peppered throughout the three uh, series. Right. This person should need no introduction at this point, but I will do an introduction. <laughs> uh, Christine Hatcher, teacher extraordinaire coach extraordinaire and now admin extraordinaire. I mean, there's not enough good things to say about her. She is, you know, she's what you want your child to have at whatever level she's doing the job. And so Christine Hatcher, I don't know, we just bring her in. Hey, Christine, how are you? <laughs> hey, um, every time I'm sitting back here going, oh my God, um, I, I hope to be that worthy, <laughs> but thank you. Like, whew, that's a lot. I, I, but I try my best. Try. <laughs> you definitely are. Uh, we're, we're also joined and rejoined uh, by an individual who was here for um, our first uh, conversation, episode one, uh, Shante Edwards. Shante Edwards is a Berkeley Unified School District parent of three and founder of the Blueprint Curriculum, uh, which is a faith-based series of foundational courses to engage students ages 12 to 18, focused on identity, discipleship, personal strengths, and community stewardship. Uh, without further ado, please welcome Shante Edwards. Hey. Hey, Shante, how's it going? Great, good to be back. Good to, good to be back. back. How the kids? <laughs> they good, they good, they good. They good. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> the kids are always happy to be out of the school and all the parents are like, what are we gonna do over the summer? So I know that parents are right in that mode of trying to, trying to figure that out. Um, it's good to have you back. Uh, we got a lot of uh, a lot of people hitting us up and saying, hey, uh, that parent that y'all had last time bought a lot of information and bought a lot of value uh, to the to the series. And so I don't know where she went, but if we can get her back, that'll be great. So thank you for joining us again. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. And then and then lastly, um, but not least, uh, we are rejoined again by Brother Tyson Amir. Uh, Tyson Amir is an author, musician, educator and community organizer. 
and freedom fighter. He's born and raised in San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, Tyson is the author of both the Black Boy Poems and the Black Boy Poems curriculum. He is also the founder and director of the Black Literacy Collective and the revolutionary education firm, Freedom Soul Media Education Initiatives. Uh, you can find more about Tyson at TysonAmir.com as well as FSMEI.org. Without further ado, please welcome back uh, to the stage, to the panel, to the virtual conversation, Brother Tyson Amir. Right on, right on. It's good to be back. It's good to be here with y'all. Thank you for allowing me to be here. I'm looking forward to the conversation this evening. Thank you. You know, uh, as I was scrubbing through looking for clips uh, to share for uh, this week and from the last the last meeting, I said, um, I don't know how much of this is actually going to fit on Twitter. I don't know how much is this going to fit on, on Facebook. But, brother, you closed us out last week uh, with some fire, and I'm hoping that we continue uh, that energy coming in, in into today. So we definitely appreciate you for being back. Let's do it. Let's do it. All right, y'all. Well, let's let's jump into this a little bit. We've been thinking and having a, a brief introduction around some things that we can do uh, at home. Um, and I know that as we, a couple months ago, Hatcher and I were thinking about framing this, he introduced me to a system. And it's not complicated, but a system that he used with his own children, right, to be able to increase interest in, in, in reading. And maybe we can start there with the primer in terms of thinking about what are some things as parents that we can do to reinforce the importance of literacy and to get our child, our children uh, engaged in, in reading. And, and Hatcher is not complicated, but I think sometimes the simple things are very important. So can you lead us off with that? And then as a panel, we can come back in with the discussion around what are some things that we might can try in the home uh, to help encourage reading? We talked about so much. So while I pretend like I remember, I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna answer the other question I wish you had asked me. You're good for that. No, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know what? I was just thinking, and I wanted to say this earlier, but I really feel like it's important. When we were, when when my parents were kids, and at some level, when I was a kid, the exo system was a meso system. Like I couldn't walk down the street without people in the neighborhood telling me what to do. Okay. My parents couldn't walk down the street without somebody telling them what to do. But nowadays, the exo system is just that—it's an exo system. Your neighbors are no longer responsible. It's not longer a village. I just wanted to say that because I thought about it while you're talking. It hadn't even hit me. So. And then what, like things with the kids for literacy, um, I mean, I, there's, I'll talk about three things. One, reading to them every day, reading in character voice, having a routine before the kids go to bed. We give the kids a bath, put them in the bed, read to them for a while, in voice, ask questions about what's going on, put, some, put a lot of affect into it. That always helps. Feel something for the character. Why, why would they do that? Oh my God, what's gonna happen next? How, 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 if that was me, I wouldn't even go in that room. I wouldn't even be that. I wouldn't even do that. That's not, that's crazy. You know what? I'm gonna put the book down. I, I can't take it. Um, and then the kids would fall asleep and literally, you know, one of us would fall asleep next to them and then the rest of the night would pass and you're like, oh my God, I didn't do anything I was supposed to do. But that's the beginning of it. <laughs> uh huh. And uh, we appreciate everybody who's uh, in a chat. This is going to be interactive tonight. Everybody who shared, uh, it seems like some folks have shared and asked others to join the conversation. So we definitely appreciate that. Um, Hatcher, can you expand upon you? You talked a little bit um, before we open it up. Uh, you shared a story about the routine of visiting bookstores, oh, yeah. right? And you, and you visited two two different bookstores intentionally, right, with with your girls, right, in order to make sure that they were one exposed to books, but then how that began to help them identify the genres and the type of books that they would like to read. Can you just share a little bit about that as well? Yes. Yeah, so we do pretty much every well, we used to do every other week. So we would go to Dr. Co I'll say the place, I don't know, I got this place in Piedmont Ave called Dr. Comics and Mr. Games, and they would pick out a comic. And then we would talk about comics, we would talk about movies, and we would talk about stories, and we would talk about what was great about them in Dr. Comics. And the staff there is awesome. If you're a teacher and you don't know how to get your kids into graphic novels or comic books, I got to say, I've gone there before and say, hey, I've got some 13-year-olds, I want them to read a book about this, and they would like point me in the direction of 10 books. The staff is awesome there. And then the other week, we would go to Marcus Books, which is a black bookstore in Oakland, and we would pick out a book. And so it was just getting in the routine of picking out books, talking about books, buying books, and you have that to look forward to, right? The kids know that, oh, we're gonna go to Marcus. Oh, we're gonna go to Dr. Comics and Mr. James. So the kids begin to expect, right? And have an expectation. That was just part of what y'all did in your household. In addition to, you know, all the other things that, uh, that you mentioned, 
uh, we won't do it today, but perhaps in a subsequent show, we can have uh, have you do your character voice, and that would be great. Maybe you can uh, do a reading for us. And I uh, but <laughs> but with, with that said, how about we bring uh, everyone else into the conversation regarding some thoughts that you might have in terms of some things that we can do at home. I do have something sitting in the back pocket called Table Talk Conversations that we, we talked about that I, I'm probably going to bring up uh, at some point. But what are some things that we find effective uh, with our children at home to encourage and to stimulate the interest in, in reading? So can I just piggyback on something um, or just add to what Hatcher said? Um, we also had a lot of books in our house. Mm and we had books that looked like them so like intentionally finding books about black characters or written by black authors or black illustrators um and allowing them to go to other i mean yes dr comics mr games marcus books was definitely uh, you, that was definitely Mike's lane. Um, I was working as a coach at the time. And so I would have to buy books in bulk. So I would always hit up, you know, I'm going to hit up, uh, was going to hit up Barnes and Noble or Moe's books. I grew up in Berkeley. So I'm going to go to Moe's or whatever and just kind of let them wander. And I think the thing is that the, that books are not sacred in that you, you can touch them. You can look through them. Um, and we used to read ourselves and so just modeling that and that that was something that was yours that that was something you could do you could always entertain yourself with a book you could always lose yourself in a book you could find yourself in a book you, books could provide all kinds of information fiction nonfiction. it really didn't matter um and i think that's because that's how it was modeled for me I remember, I think I spoke of it last week, like buying the newspaper from my grandfather. I grew up in Berkeley. I used to live right behind Longfellow. So I would walk from my house on California Street to my grandfather's house on Acton Street. And there was a store and he would give me 50 cents the night before to pick up the newspaper. And I had to make sure it was a newspaper with four stars. That meant it was a more final newspaper than the one with two stars. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, the Sunday paper was a big deal. So I think just like kind of modeling and letting them know that, you know, there wasn't anything that wasn't accessible to them. They could find anything they needed, you know, in a book. And yeah, that I was a big piggyback on your piggyback. I'm sorry, guys. It just hit me. You may piggyback, piggyback on my piggyback. Yes. So my piggyback for your piggyback <laughs> is what's fascinating about books as opposed to visual media like TV or movies is when I'm reading my kids a book, the characters are black. It doesn't matter what the author thought when they wrote it, right? Like when I'm reading a story, the character is black because my dad's reading it. He's black. That's right. the beauty of lit. like in lit. The character is how you see it. And the other thing is what we would do is sometimes reading stories. We would I would ask specific questions like, where are the black people right now? Mm -hmm. Like or what would black people be doing, especially if it's historical fiction? Right. Like I wonder, you know, like, is this really the way that would happen? Right. Will we do it this way? Ah, oh, daddy, I don't think we would do that. Blah, blah, blah. Right. Like people screaming at the screen in horror movies. Right. Like, don't go in. You know, you shouldn't go in. But I mean, <laughs> it's the same thing. If you are the narrator, the characters are you. And that's the beauty of it. So your kids get exposed to all kinds of literature about black people. As far as I'm concerned, my kids thought all the characters in Harry Potter were black. <laughs> Yeah. And before we uh, before we bring uh, and highlight, I want to bring in uh, Shantae in a, in a second, but um, I'm going to I'm going to go to to Tyson. But before I do, um, I, I've been giving a lot to that whole idea around a newspaper. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, y'all. Sometimes I mix people up. But was it Carter G. Woodson who who was the brother who uh, worked in the coal mines before he went to went to Harvard? Um, I forget. I, I'll look it up. But the brother was uh, he, he was literate and could read, but he went to, to I think, Virginia and uh, the brothers in the coal mines, they couldn't read, but they wanted to be literate, i.e. they wanted to make better decisions. They wanted to be happy. Right. And they wanted to do risk assessment. So they paid this young brother to read the newspaper. Right. As a way of getting an understanding of what was happening in the world and saying we can't necessarily read the words that are on this paper, but we have uh, access to someone in the community who was able to to do that and to utilize that. And so I've been giving a lot of thought to that newspaper conversation. Uh, I was listening to Dr. Uh, Greg Carr, uh, Africa, uh, Africa studies out of, uh, um, out of Howard, 
Um, and he was saying the same thing. He says, I can go digital with the newspaper, but when I get the newspaper in front of my doorsteps, it reminds me of my father. And I watch my father read at the dinner table or at the breakfast table with his cup of coffee. And I carry on that legacy and tradition with the newspaper. And so I, I think uh, he might have not ever had an explicit conversation with his father about the importance of reading that newspaper. But just seeing his father do that, he carries that now on in a digital age with a paper copy of the newspaper, whether or not it's soaking wet from the rain or in the snow where he is in D.C., he dries it out. Right. And he makes sure that he reads that newspaper. Now, I had a question that I wanted to or something I want to uplift for for Tyson. So we mentioned the Black Boy Poems book as well as the curriculum. Uh, but a hidden piece of that that is behind the scenes in terms of we saw last week, Sister Sa Sasha in the, in the chat, as well as Hatcher talking about reading and having your, your, your child hear you read the stories. Well, Tyson is doing that with the whole electronic series that he also has with his curriculum. Uh, can you talk about that, Tyson, and maybe how that influenced your decision to say not only is it important for kids to see it on the text, but they're also it's also important for them to hear me do it as well as the way that you do it. It, it has a certain cadence and a certain form to your poetry. Can you speak about that as well, the importance of having the students uh, and children actually hear you read? No doubt. No doubt. Like that was when y'all were talking. I thought a lot about on my experience coming up and how. I felt I began to engage deeper with with literacy and what it meant to me. So like reading books, like what, what Hatcher was saying, my, my father, he exposed me to comic books. And so that was a, a great path for me. And then stimulating imagination, connecting with characters, being able to combine what I'm reading with what I'm seeing. And so for me, I've always been somebody that likes to engage in things on a with, with multiple senses. I want to be able to see it. I want to be able to hear it. I want to be able to, to feel it, smell it potentially. You know what I'm saying? Like have be, be completely wrapped up in it. And I think that is part of what influences my writing. And then, I mean, you know, that brings us to Black Boy Poems, the Black Boy Poems curriculum. And then like I, I had a good friend of mine and she was telling me about this, this thing that not necessarily she was diagnosed with, but like she was described as having this thing called synesthesia. It's like the blending of senses. Hmm. And when she was talking about that, I was like, yeah, that's that's me. Like when I hear sounds, I see color. So apparently my sense of, of, of hearing is connected to my sense of sight. And depending on what sound, like the other day I was sitting here at my desk, I was hearing somebody playing some music uh, from the street and there's a whole bunch of like Rhodes piano. So the, the, the notes that were being played from the roads invoked a, a deep color of blue for me. And when I'm writing, I know I write best to music that gives me that blue color in my mind. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm hearing something, but I'm seeing something. And so when it came to combining or putting the curriculum together because of my experience and then also how you know other folks who are learners are out there, I wanted to be able to provide as many opportunities for people to be able to engage with the text and then going deeper into an analysis of what the text is. So sometimes we think of the text and it's in a physical book, which is great, but the text and, and in like also being a practitioner of an oral tradition, which we now want to refer to as hip hop, which is cool with me, you know what I'm saying? The text is the people, the text is the soul. And so there's so much that comes from the literacy of being able to see, hear, feel the way that the, the sound resonates from a person. You know what I'm saying? Like that stuff hits hard, you, you feel that. And that in my mind, and I think for a lot of our young people, when they're in school and they're engaging with content like that, they don't feel it because they don't read it that way. You know what I'm saying? The way that the information is being presented to mm -hmm. them, it doesn't have that same that same level of, of of soul in it, so it doesn't resonate the same way in the ways that we read. Like, like what what Hatcher was saying, we watching the the film. We in the film, fam. We ain't just watching right. the audience. We in the story. So when it comes to like reading the book or seeing the thing, we're in that because we feel it, and that's that's even part of our vernacular. I feel you, fam. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like, I feel it's not just yeah. I, I see that. I understand that. No, I feel you. I'm in it. Like I'm. I'm part of the experience with you. So the more that I felt I could build that, because it just made sense for me, 
it might make sense for other folks. So when they get the book, they can read it, but they're also gonna get it directly from the source so they can see it. They So see the way that it comes across. You know what I'm saying like, if I, I'll spit a couple bars right now, not to you know take a lot of time. Oh, good, I feel I'll you. Bars, right? So you know what I'm saying? You do, and you about to feel it. <laughs> I say, when my pen taps the paper, the ink begins to dance. It's never corrugated graph. These are the stories of warriors past. Adrenaline rush, fill the euphoria blast. It registered in the pleasure centers of the brain. I got them swimming in that dopamine like these bars with dipping coke and mean. That boy flows so mean like he Gene Oker lean. But back to my opus though, my focus be on the same level as Stokely in 63. Y'all can quote me, I wrote this for my people to be free. You know what I'm saying? It keeps going, but like just in that, you see it because you see the the way that the face is moving, you know, the, the enunciation of a certain word, the way that we pause between this word beginning and this word ending, that's part of the literacy of it, but then it's the sound, it's the rhythm, it's the feel. So you get that because that can only be presented from the original source that created it, and then you can read it, and then you can break it down in other ways as well. So I wanted to make sure that people had as many different entry points and we're able to use all those different ways of practicing literacy that we do to experience the content and grow with the content, feel the content and be moved by it. Yeah, I appreciate that. And before we before we pivot to get Shantae's thoughts, um, I, I've been a, a personal witness and can to attest to introducing students to Tyson and saying we have someone special here before you and them giving the blank code stare to Tyson until he does exactly what he just did. And then after he does that, you see there's a gateway that opens up to further and deeper conversations, right? And so Stokely Carmichael was mentioned in that, right? And so now we have a gateway and a pathway towards the introduction to having a conversation about who that brother was. And so without that, right, sometimes the way that we present material can be valuable, but it's not resonating with the audience at hand, i.e. children, students, et cetera. Um, I, I'm recalling um, as a child uh, and thinking about uh, there used to be over the summer, Oakland Public Library. Um, I think we have great mm -hmm. library systems. Uh, and I remember at one time they had um, this uh, competition kind of. And it was like to get students to be able to, to, to read over the summer, uh, learning law, summer learning slide, all those things, right, to, to encourage reading. And it was a thing where if you read so many books, you would get a, a free ticket to the A's game. And, um, you know, outside looking in, you could say, well, you know, that's fine. You get a, a free ticket to the Oakland A's. They're not that good anyway. Good luck with that. Right. But what it meant for me and my family to be able to read and get access to those tickets that we otherwise wouldn't have had and the motivation that I had to do it for my own household and community, I read my behind off that summer. Right. I was incentivized to go out there and do it, not because of the competition. Right. I was incentivized to go out there and do it because in my family and my household, we had an outing that we otherwise wouldn't have had. Now, those seagulls at the top. Right. They were bothering us the whole game and they wasn't good seats. But guess what? We got on a transit, a.k.a. the BART system here in Oakland, California, and we had a good time together. Right. So I wonder. Right. Shantae, you can share any thoughts that you you want to share. Right. But I, I was thinking. Are there any ways that you found particularly that you've been able to incentivize reading at home and build that into your incentive structures? Sometimes I think as parents, we're like, they do it because they're supposed to, or you do it because I said so. And that that's not going to work. So just wondering, what might that be? How do you motivate your kids at home or any re reflections or thoughts, et cetera, to anything that's been shared thus far? Yes, there's there was a lot of richness in there. Um, one being something that resonated with Miss Christine. She said, you know, books are not sacred, but in our house, they are. Mm -hmm. I understand what she means about accessibility, but for us, like, um, books are special. Books are an escape or a way for instruction. And it is exciting for us to get in the car and go to the library. That's a thing. Like, we're going to the library, y'all. Like, make sure you get your, the biggest backpack you can find. We're going to go get our books. Um, even when, you know, my oldest gets, you know, all fours or, or um, you know, good grades. It's like, okay, we're going to get some books. And, you know, not that we don't get them all the time, but he knows, you know, sometimes mommy chooses what he's going to read, but there's sometimes where he's like, I'm going to get exactly what I want to read. And he has a list sometimes like, all right, I'm ready to get this book or that book. And 
you know, sometimes when they get home from school, I, I wrap them. I wrap them in wrapping paper. I put a bow on it and put it on the bed and they get home. They're like, whoa, what is this? And they open it and it's a book. Um, and so just those, those incentives are good too. And um, just making it uh, more of a prize. Like this is, this is, instruction for you or, or this is a, a way for you to escape or this is uh, a gateway to a new world um, or like I said like a field trip we're getting on BART we're going downtown we're going to the library um, yeah so we make it a big we make it a big thing Books absolutely are- absolutely wondering um in a, in a few we're going to transition to a very special guest that I'm going to introduce in a second but before we get there I wonder if there are any uh, other thoughts from some of the the, uh, the other parents or um, even in the comments, what incentives do we do at home to incentivize our students and our children to be able to read further? Uh, it does look like um, our uh, super, super executive producer, Charles Cole, yeah. is in the virtual building somewhere. He says that uh, we are on our own. Uh, so having five black folks discussing black literacy and what we can do to save ourselves is special. Uh, take it in, audience. Take it in. It's a beautiful thing. So shouts out to Dr. Charles Cole. Uh, we appreciate you having having you here. But what are what are some f- final thoughts around this particular conversation before we transition into, I, I guess it would be the meso system. Can I can I before you do that transition? Um, first of all, Shantae, you thank you for the like clarifying the whole I, sacred versus accessible. I, I appreciate that um, because that is what I meant. Even when I said it, I was like that probably isn't the word that I should have used. So good good catch on that. Thank you very much. Um, But what I want to just remind folks of is something that it's something that Tyson said and something that Hatcher, you know, uh, alluded to around the notion of storytelling and like, and as, as black folks are storytellers, right? And so you can find your voice, even if they are not necessarily your words, how bringing your voice to a text can change how that story lands with, with your child or with students. So what I will say, I don't necessarily talk about my teaching style a whole heck of a lot because I don't necessarily think that that was special. But one of the things that um, I will say that I did that was really effective with my students and then like with uh, with my children in terms of my reading, um, when I was teaching in Oakland, we were using a program. We were using Open Court, and Open Court came with, you know, a lot of bells and whistles, and it came with like a CD. I almost said, it, almost said a cassette tape. Would that have dated me. That would have made me really old. Right? But it came with a CD, and you would have to play the CD of the of the story being read. And I used to. Um, I would do that because I was implementing with fidelity, wink, nod. I would implement with fidelity. But the following day, I would read the story. And I remember the principal came in and she was like, Chris, why are you rereading the story? And I was like, because I want them to hear me. I want them to I want them to mimic me. If they don't have a clue about where to go, I want them to mimic me because my voice sounds more like theirs than the narrator sounds like theirs. Mm -hmm. Right. And in the reading of that story, I could stop and do commentary and we could, you know, oh, why would they do that? Like one of my favorite. I love this story. It was um, called uh, About Spring. And the main character was King Shabazz. And I remember his his line was his mother was like, spring is around the corner. And he leaned out the window and said, where is it at? (laughs) And every time we said, I mean, right, because, of course, that's what kids say. And and. And I just remember like in that moment, the first time I read this or I laughed and the kids were like, why are you laughing? I was like, that's so funny. Cause that's totally what a kid would say. Like springs around the corner, we looking for something. And, and, and like that generating a dialogue, kids could attach, they could see themselves in that experience, right? Mm-hmm. They could see themselves. So like just developing, developing who they were through my through my telling of the story even though they were not my words i think um it does give kids something that they actually can attach to and engage with in in ways that they may not have been otherwise able by just them necessarily like reading the words on a page so it is super important to i say all that say it's important to read to and with your kids right finding those finding those pockets of time I want to add something to that. My my bad, to, for, for jumping in on that. Um, so 
all of that, like it's important to to read to, to read with and to create that culture. And and so the, the other experience that I feel that I have and some of the folks on the call might have it as well with publishing. So with publishing the book Black Boy Poems and then when we founded the Black Literary Collective. So the Black Literary Collective consists of 10 Black authors. We have six brothers, we have four sisters. So when it comes to the different authors and the things that people have produced, have published, we have folks that have done um, like self-help work. So emotional intelligence at the homie DB. We got the homie Ice Mike who has like nine different novels, a whole bunch of fiction stuff. He has, you know, some poetry stuff. He has a memoir. Um, Malik Wade from the city who got his memoir pressure. Tongo Eisen Martin, who's the San Francisco Poet Laureate. Uh, Khalid White, Dr. Khalid White, who's uh, in San Jose, who's a, a professor at San Jose City College. And then for the sisters, we have Tamisha Booker, who's a children's book author. And then Melissa Jones, a great poet. Sister Joy Elam, who's a poet, journalist, uh, novelist as well. And then Alia Gabrez, who has a children's book like seeing folks who are seeing the same thing that we're talking about, right? The same situation because there is, you know, such a need for quality content. Let's just produce it ourselves. And then the next level to it is when we get our young people to be a part of that process, mm -hmm. they begin to see literature in a different way. So it's one thing for it to be something that it's been created around you and you engage with it that way, which is important. It's another thing when, you're now creating that reality for yourself. And then you learn that process of how to make it real. And then like when we're thinking about this idea of black liberation through literature, liberation, self-determination, self-determining, we make it ourselves. And so when we have that, like the, the culture, if we're thinking about the culture of literature is we consume it, we engage, we're exposed to it. Let's create it as well. You know what I'm saying? Like that's another, integral part of the process and of the culture and in doing that the the impact that it has the influence that it has on people like when i look at some of the young people that have participated in programming that we have where there's a publishing outcome they remember that and their relationship with literature is forever changed as a result of it because now at the end of it they have a book with their material their faces on the back cover as the author whatever it might be like you're changing the relationship that we have with literature and then we're creating the stuff that might be missing when it comes to what we're looking for and we got a whole bunch of gifted great black talented authors we need to be you know uh immersed in that as well but that we still need more and so thinking about how we can create that as a community as young people i think that's also an important part of the conversation that uh you know we need to reflect on yeah, and before we uh, before we pivot uh, shortly to a brother Christopher Oaks in a second, uh, we'll do a, a great introduction for him. But but before we pivot, I had a, a couple of things that came to mind, Tyson, as you were talking, it, it's never too early for our students to start producing and writing their own stories, and so I think that that is something that's critical and important, right? Um, or our children, I, I don't have to wait until after I go get that college degree to say I want to be an author and get the word out, right? So I, I think encouraging early writing as a form of boosting up literacy as well is something that's critically important. Um, there are, we have some brilliant students that I've, I've been encouraging to actually begin to write and then become self-published. In particular, I remember one student that we had, she was really fired up about Breonna Taylor and had done all his research and had reported it back to the class. And we've been pushing her to put that pen to paper and just write out the story. We'll help you edit it. We'll get that done. But this is our babies getting their word out. So I think that that's important. But one of the things I want to highlight before we pivot to Chris Oaks is that oftentimes you hear, and I hear this a lot from families, I just don't have time. I'm working two jobs, right? I, I have all this stuff going on. Where do I find the time to be able to have these conversations? In the car, point A to point B, from the house to the grocery store. But another thing I used to remember, and I remember this as a kid vividly, the, the table, the dinner table, you got to eat. You got to eat breakfast. You got to eat lunch. You, to sustain ourselves, we have to eat. And that takes some time, right? And I remember sometimes when my mother would be cooking, and I'm, I'm doing a lot of shout outs to my mother because we're talking about being at home, right? And so I remember how she might be cooking, even if it was a TV dinner. It's going to take about 20 minutes for that TV dinner to get done. She's asking me, what have you been reading? What are the characters doing? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, maybe we were watching a TV show. Back in my day as a family, we would watch Moesha. That was our thing, right? We would watch Moesha on TV. And in between the commercials, my, my mom and 
my Nana, they'd be asking me questions about about school. I want to know, have you all embedded that in your practices at home? Or what do you think about this idea around table talk conversations or stealing time, the time that you don't think that you have? How do we creatively think about opportunities to have these conversations? Someone said last time, you don't always have to be structured. You don't always have to have a, a super regimented routine. But what are some ideas that we might have in terms of for the busy parent, for the parent that's working double nine to fives or the double shifts? How do we steal time for literacy? What are some thoughts about that before we transition to Chris O? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I think the opposite is true. You don't have time not to talk to your kids about story. Mm. Um, diegesis, like in narrative, diegesis is telling a story and mimesis is showing, right, without telling. But it's important to understand that because your life is a story you tell yourself over and over. And if you're a crappy storyteller, what's your life going to be? Right. And so it's it's like I'll give an example. I, I used to do things with the girls like I have favorite stories. This wasn't like me having some magical abilities. It just is how I am as a person. There are stories I really like. And I would start talking about them because I'm excited about them. like there's a story by Clive Barker. He's a horror author, but he writes really adult stories. He wrote this story that I think is funny and good called The Yattering and Jack. And Jack. Yeah. When the girls were little, I would talk about The Yattering and Jack. And they'd be like, oh, my God, can we read it? Now you're too little. <laughs> well, tell us what happened. I can't tell you what happened. That would ruin it. Right. So the oldest kid, when she hits, I don't know, 13, can I read the Yattering and Jack? Yes. <laughs> now you're old enough. Right. That's that's like eight years of wanting to read a story. Eight years of hearing about this story. Eight years of talking about stories. Eight years of saying you can read this and you can't read that. And what's this? And, you know, the kids will tell you stories. But Mike, I think, too, but we got to be mindful, like, because when we say you don't not have time, you do have we do have to acknowledge that life mm -hmm. is grinding right <laughs> like life can be very really grinding depending on you know depending on your situation i think some of the things that kamar said around you know i'm talking to my mom while she's making dinner yeah. she doesn't have to read with me but i'm talking which is like one of the things we used to tell parents let them talk to you while you're making dinner have them read something to you at that time um to the to you know writers read other writers um so write you know write your own story tell your story tell your poem i mean i do think you have to it is sometimes stealing time and in, into i mean it was interesting i think there's like a little bit of revisionist history on on our part as parents because i think if you go back and ask you ask the the yeah. girls, did they do this all the time? They'll be like, no, <laughs> they did not do this. You know, Tell like, it. In our minds, we were doing big things, but they didn't necessarily, you know, I don't know that they necessarily saw it in the in the fond way that we now recall as 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 they tell us stories. There were some right? tense moments. No, <laughs> right. I mean, <laughs> so, I mean, um, but what I'm saying is, well, I mean, because what I was that's what I meant though, and maybe I didn't say it clearly. You talking to your kid about what's going on is a story they hear. Yeah. Them responding to you is a story they hear, right? Like it's not, it doesn't have to be the book at the table that you're reading. Like talking to your kid about stuff that you know is sometimes equally, if not better, as good. But I don't know. Yeah. If, if I could change the literacy part. Absolutely. Let's give uh, Shantae the last, the last one on this. I heard her give a mm hmm somewhere in there. So <laughs> why don't you bring that, that mm hmm to light as, before we transition to Chris Oaks? Because I was thinking about, you know, when my oldest was young and I worked so hard and I barely, I, for me, I was like, I don't have any time to do anything, let alone use the restroom. How do mm -hmm. I have time to do these things? And it became, like Christine said, stealing the time. When I'd walk my son to school, we're looking at signage. What, he's, what does that sign say? What does this sign say? And then that clicks in my mind a story about when I was younger and about my mother. And that becomes a story, right? Or, you know, if I don't have time to finish the stories, like, you know what? Let's circle back around at bedtime and you can tell me how your day was and I'll tell you how my day was and we'll finish then. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and of course, while I'm making dinner, come in here, come come help me with dinner. And that's a time for me to steal that, you know, well, how was your day? And, you know, what did you do? And I'm gonna tell you what I did. And and so, yeah, there, it, it's rough when, you, when you're working and you, you don't feel like you have the time to put in to actually sit down and read a book. Um, but storytelling is, is right there, right there. Uh -huh. Uh huh. And, and, and shout out to uh, Sister Sasha in the in the chat. She says, "Just ask your children uh, some things they're interested in about TikTok or something like that." I have no clue 
what TikTok is about, right? But I could pretend that I'm interested in it to get them to be talking, right? Um, and the reason why I asked about stealing time is because um, we we sometimes get boxed in into buying into the ideals around what it means to be a good parent, right? And they'll tell you that if you're not sitting aside 20 minutes a day to go over the homework and talk about reading with your kid, that you're a bad parent. But you're not a bad parent. There's a way to play this sub game where you can steal back some time and still get the end result that you want to get based on the routines and structures that you do normally anyway. So I think that we should think about that as we carry through uh, with the conversation. And I want to bring uh, a very special brother, uh, not only a very special brother to Berkeley Unified School District, but a, a very special brother to me. Um, and I want to bring another quote back from uh, this book by uh, Brother Amos Wilson, right? Awakening the Natural Genius of Black Children before I introduce this brother. Uh, and right before chapter five, he says that uh, in the revolutionary school, I know why I study. But in the colonial school, I was studying like the blind. In the revolutionary school, I know why I study. But in the colonial school, I was studying like the blind. And I wanted to preface that quote before I introduce Brother Oaks, because I believe that this brother has done a wonderful job of getting students in Berkeley Unified School District to understand why they are actually attending school. Uh, and so without further ado, I would like to do this quick introduction and then bring in our beloved brother, uh, Christopher Oaks. Chris Oaks is the lead instructor and lead instructor of the Mosier program in Berkeley Unified School District, which is a cultural, cultural enrichment program. Uh, he is a dedicated educator with an unwavering commitment to helping young people fulfill their maximum potential. Throughout his career, he has successfully fostered inclusive educational environments for both students and student athletes. As a social justice advocate and agent for change, he is expressly dedicated to supporting African-American students. Prior to joining Berkeley Unified School District, Brother Oaks played a vital role as the academic support coordinator uh, for the UC Berkeley men's basketball team. Uh, Mr. Oaks is a native of Oakland, California, and was a star athlete at Castleman High School. Uh, he played collegiate basketball at San Jose State University, where he would earn his BA degree in African-American studies. Following his career at San Jose State, Oaks played professional basketball in Germany. After retiring from basketball, Oaks earned his master's degree in education from UC Santa Cruz. Without further ado, please welcome my colleague and beloved friend, Brother Chris Oaks. Peace, peace. Peace. What's going on, brother? How you doing? Good, how are you? Man, I'm blessed, man. This is a beautiful conversation. Uh, I had the opportunity to join in on part one and part two and be a, uh, a listener. So. Uh, I'm so uh, excited to be a part of this conversation uh, this week. Thank you. You mind if, um, because you, uh, you're new to the audience, you ain't new to me, right? But you're right, new right. to the audience. If we spend a little bit of time uh, for the audience just to get to get to know you a little bit. Now, uh, I know that a lot of us on here have ties to the Bay Area, uh, mm -hmm. but in particular, uh, there's a special kinship for folks from Oakland. Uh, you, right. you were born and raised in, in Oakland. How, how was that experience growing up in Oakland for you? Yeah, born and raised in Oakland, uh, grew up through the uh, OUSD system, uh, went to Webster Academy, okay. went to Havens Court, graduated from Castlemont. And so, uh, so yeah, so I, you know, this is, this is my community. Uh, I, I grew up uh, during the nineties. And so, you know, anybody who was here during the nineties know that this was a place that, you know, was a lot of crime, a lot of violence, uh, the crack epidemic. But it also was uh, very pronounced in, you know, black community and black consciousness. And so, uh, you know, while, you know, I was navigating a lot of the, the dangers of the city, there also was a lot of opportunities here in the city uh, that I had opportunities to, you know, uh, embrace and be a part of. And so, uh, yeah, Oakland was a is a magical place, uh, even though it's, it's starting to become very much gentrified. Uh, it's still a magical place. So yeah, it's I'm, all right. We 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 still here. Uh, yes, and and, yes, and Oaks, is, Oaks is talking about you know that that rose that grew from from concrete. Like this yes, brother right. has an amazing story, uh, and he's here. And um, you know, it, it's my understanding that perhaps initially education maybe wasn't what you were initially on the on the path to do. Can you can right. you talk us through uh, that intentional decision that you had around? You know what? I I gotta get there. I gotta be yeah. involved with education. How did you end up? Uh, making that pivot towards education. Yeah, well, again, I, I graduated from Councilman, but I was I was a, I was an athlete. I was a basketball player, and uh, you know it afforded me an opportunity to to go to college and get, kind of get away from the city. So I went to uh, San Jose State. Uh, you know, four years 
you know, was a starter and all of that. And then I, I graduated uh, AFAM where I further, you know, studied more about my history and culture. And then I, I went off to, to Europe and um, any basketball player, any athlete at some point got to hang it up. Mm -hmm. um, hang it up early. Some hang it up a little late. And uh, I just remember sitting in Germany thinking about, you know, making that transition as I was hanging up my jersey and on my way back home. And I came across an article and partly the reason why I got into education was this article I read about how less than 2% of black men are teachers. Mm -hmm. And this was way back, uh, what was this? This is like 2012, 2013. And so that was partly, and then I also thought about, again, that consciousness, that black consciousness I was exposed to uh, during my childhood here in Oakland. And all of the people who were, you know, in the city participating uh, in leadership roles, uh, all of my mentors, they always spoke about coming back and giving service. Mm -hmm. and I just thought, what better way for me to give my service than to tap into education and, and, and put myself in the classroom? Yeah, absolutely. We we breaking all kinds of stereotypes tonight, right? Mm -hmm. um, that that brothers is not invested and involved in the community. And you mm -hmm. made an intentional decision. It wasn't something that you just happened upon, right? You weren't right. just working a job and decide, well, I'll just stay here. You made an, an intentional decision uh, for a reason. And that intentionality, intentionality mm -hmm. um, allows you to be able to do a couple of things, right? Your undergraduate degree and, right. and black studies. What, what was the stat? I think there's a, a particular stat. How many people were involved with that when you and your graduating class was less than 5% or what? Five man, it was very small, man. Very, very small. Very small. A lot of folks, you know, uh, particularly athletes, you know, we don't graduate college, you mm -hmm. know? So, uh, I, I was one of the lucky ones that was able to do it. But yeah, the number was was quite small. Yeah. And and building on that foundation of, of African-American studies, mm -hmm. black studies, um, then jumping into the master's program, mm -hmm. I felt like uh, it was divine intervention because those things gave you the tools that you needed to do this thing that you've been doing in, in Berkeley Unified called Emoja. So you are the yeah. lead instructor of uh, the Emoja program. And before yeah. we bring everybody else back into the conversation, into the fold, can you talk to us a little bit about what that program is? Because I think it fits nicely with our understanding around these meso systems, right? Mm -hmm. Systems and the sub game within the school that we can actualize as black folks towards the end goal of helping our students be more free. Can you tell us a little bit about what the Moja program is? Yeah, I, I'll definitely talk about the Moja program, but for those of you who don't know what the word means, Moja is a, is a word uh, that represents, a Kiswahili word that represents unity, unity in the family, unity in the community, unity amongst our people. And so uh, the class is designed to help our young people uh, holistically, um, you know, geared towards uh, their history and culture. So we uh, are very intentional in our class with uh, enriching our young people with their culture. Everything about the class is cultural. The way we talk is cultural. The principles we study is cultural. The books that we uh, engage with are cultural. The people that we, the images we have are all cultural. And the end goal is uh, to help our young people to get a knowledge of themselves so that they can start becoming agents of change. And so uh, we do this uh, in, in a very uh, holistic way, uh, much different than, you know, uh, the, the traditional setting in the classroom. We do more of a, a, a democratic classroom setting. And um, yeah, we build their confidence. And from building that confidence, they begin to, uh, you know, dive into their, their consciousness around what's happening around them. And then ultimately um, get a level of competency uh, around the history and culture that they explore. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, last question before we bring uh, everybody back, mm -hmm. uh, a brother who's doing powerful work with black students, for black students in the mm -hmm. community, getting parents involved is, is bound to, to face oh. some type of resistance. Yes, uh, what what barriers perhaps have been uh, uplifted uh, to your work? Because I want to bring in uh, everyone else to kind of yeah. address that. Right. We're going to talk about how these programs need to be there and what we can do in the school. But we also got to talk about something Tyson said. If Emoja is going to be an a institution, a small institution in a predominantly white institution, right, right. a sub game, how do we protect that? So what are some of the things maybe you've been facing in terms of uh, barriers to, to your work or to, to, to what you got going on? Yeah, well, I, you know, I just think we're just being a, a, a black educator, man, it, regardless of the class, it, it would be a challenge. But it's even more of a challenge when you are, you know, being intentional about teaching, you know, black history and culture. Uh, but one of the one of the, the beautiful bright spots about it is 
it, it takes a little extra work, but I think it's beneficial in the long run is is connecting with families and connecting with parents and, you know, going above and beyond to, uh, you know, uh, link the parents into what we're doing in the classroom and inviting the, the parents into the classroom um, so that they could, you know, it, again, this is holistic. When we think about, um, you know, African history and culture, when we think about our, our community, you know, there's always been an element of the, the community being in the classroom, the parents being in the classroom uh, and, it, and, and it being a full wraparound for everyone. We appreciate you being here. You must have been reading my mind around a parent piece because we actually have a parent who is here today, whose son is in in the program, who started off strong. And even though that right. that uh, that student has uh, has started off digitally, right? That student is really engaged. And I just want to know before we bring in everybody into the fold, I want to give first dibs uh, for Shantae to talk about perhaps as Brother Oaks has. And we got to say Brother Oaks or something like that because we got a Christine and a Chris so we can't confuse the two, right? But as Brother Oaks, we're talking about, uh, you know, how this program has been. How has your experience been as a parent and the value that you've seen uh, on the back end, Shantae, for uh, for your baby? Mm, that's a loaded question. But um, first, can I just say thank you to Brother Oaks? Mm -hmm. um, I'll keep with the tradition of brother because this is how he honors my student when he talks to my student in class. It's always a brother, Julian. It's always mm -hmm. a sister. Um, and Umoja is uh, one of the key reasons that I put my son at Longfellow. Mm -hmm. If I could just be real. Um, it was that they have, you know, a larger demographic of Black educators and they have a Black vice principal, but there was also this program that was dedicated to teaching my son about who he was and where he comes from. Um, and Amir said something last week that really resonated with me that if you aren't learning about yourself and your culture and your community and your origins, mm -hmm. you're not really getting a complete education. So with Julian being in that program, um, coupled with other teachers that are of color, coupled with students that look like him, I feel like he's getting a complete education. So thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. A 360. And as, as we, um, as we bring everyone back, I, I, I am wondering, right? Uh, we talked about it's a cultural enrichment uh, program in class that students get an opportunity to learn about themselves. But, but maybe what are some of the other quote unquote sub games that need to be played? That is, that is a, a master schedule based um, class that kids can take throughout the school day. Uh, but what are some of the other things that we are seeing that might be critical to help inform right the sub game within the school system? A couple of things that that come to mind for me is last week or maybe the week before Hatcher talked about um, this game that you have to play with communication. How often and how frequent is the, the teacher notifying you and having conversations with you about your students ability, not about their grades, right? Not about whether or not they turn in the work that they assign, but about their abilities, their skills, et cetera. Another thing that has come up often is uh, this pipe pipeline to special ed, this expedited freeway, fast lane, carpool lane for black students and particularly black boys to go to special ed. What sub game can we play around that? These are just some things that are, are in my mind that I know that parents and students face quite often uh, in my school district. And uh, research shows that it's quite often something that happens across the nation. Right. It's, it's a that's the pandemic that's upon us, if we honest about it. Right. Uh, but what are some of the things that we need to pay attention to and how do we uplift a quote unquote sub game around those things and give some um, perhaps some strategies uh, for our audience this evening on how we can subvert those things and maybe get around them? If I could be indulged for just a second, um, it's your world. I don't know. I wish if it was, it wouldn't be. Oof, never mind. I don't even get started. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, there's this. I'm, I'm gonna tell this story. Kamar knows this story. There's this pernicious institution that this country was founded on, and you know, it takes it's taking black people from their families. Uh, it subjects them to dehumanizing, inhumane conditions for years for years where they sit in these spaces and work for other people to get things done for other people. And they're debased and dehumanized as they do work for other people. And then like, if you do a good job working for other people, they might let you go to a bigger house where you could sit mm -hmm. at the table with other people and look out at the people who were in the other house and make fun of them because you've come along, mm. right? Okay. Most people would say, oh yeah, that's that S word. I hate that word, slavery, but it's not. It's the other S word. It's school. Hmm. 
School is built on a plantation model. You steal people's kids from this, them and you, you treat them like crap for 12 years. And then you tell them, but if you do what we say, then you can go to a bigger house so you can hang out with more people who are going to treat you like crap, but it'll be a different kind of crap. College. Right? So my point is, if you want to play the sub game, when you go into that building, think that way. How do I get my kid through this? And is everything these people are telling me in my kid's best interest? Right? Like, oh, your kid didn't finish my work. What is he doing? Picking cotton? <laughs> your, your kid didn't turn in this assignment. Really? Is it bananas? Are we on a plantation? Oh my God, my God. Uh, <laughs> my, <laughs> Sorry. <man>. <laughs> just like. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, Jesus. how many times have kids been failed and not mm -hmm. got to finish school because they didn't turn in an assignment? Nobody said anything about mastering a standard or learning. They just said, this kid didn't do what I asked him to do. Yeah, that's important. Yeah. I think it goes back to your risk assessment. Go, go ahead. Uh, nope. Chris, say, <laughs> the, the unfortunate <laughs> thing, I mean, and the unfortunate thing is that all of us, you know, like, like 25 plus years, the unfortunate thing is that all of us who came through this system of like these teacher education programs, that is basically, I was like, that's how we've been indoctrinated, right? That was what, that was what it was. And I, and I'm not quite sure like when there was a collective like shift, I think for folks, maybe maybe it was when we started looking at, my gosh, there's an over identification of black kids, specifically black, black boys in special education. Like, wait a minute, that's not what that is. Or maybe it was this proliferation of of suspensions, disciplinary issues, um, they were being defiant. Well, how was that being defiant? Like they were asking a question. I mean, I think there was something, there there was something that triggered something else, but you know, it, 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 it's painful to acknowledge that even you in the classroom, me in the classroom, I mean, sometimes I'm sure Kamar, you've had kids like roll through and you're like, you know what? Like you're doing the most. So yeah. I'm going to send you home so you can get yourself together. And then we're going to try this again later. And it's not until you have opportunity to like sit and reflect, like what might've been going on with that kid that you go, shoot, that was a missed opportunity. I think now we're just really trying to be more like conscious of, of the things that we do and that we say and like getting to like those root causes so that we can create space because now we know there's no space how we can really create space for kids to be successful in the in in the current system that we have and to the point we haven't been we have not been doing a great job but how can we while we are trying to create space in the system that we have how do we build new spaces like yeah. Where, where how, we need a new, we need an off ramp to a new space. So we're trying to do, we're trying to do these things simultaneously, which I think is, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, and I'm not saying we shouldn't be hard on ourselves, but man, you know, at the time it really felt like we were doing the best that we could um, with what we knew. And now that we know more, you know, the, the, the push is to do better. Mm -hmm. and yeah, shout out to, to the return of the person. They said, we need, uh, we need safe spaces. I think we also need brave spaces. Go ahead, Tyson. No doubt. There's a couple of things that come to mind for me. Um, some of the quotes that I, I bring in on, on my programming, uh, with students. And so one is from, you know, uh, our elder Steve Biko, he said, the greatest weapon in the hand of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. And so like this is what you were saying, Christine, on that, it, it made me reflect on that because if we're thinking we were doing the best with what we knew at that time, that's a direct result of what Hatcher was saying earlier because this is a, a colonial byproduct. Mm -hmm. And so the colonial mandate is indoctrination. The colonial focus is perpetuation to sustain itself in order for this thing to continue to survive and in order for it to survive, who are the people who have to be exploited and oppressed the most? Our people and indigenous people. They stole their land, they ain't giving it back to them, although they want to have all this conversation about equity, equality, but equity defined by them. If we if you really gonna be equitable, give them back their land, fam. Facts. If we really talking about it, give them their land back. You ain't trying to do that. So like don't let's not play with the game. So there's an indoctrination that has to go along with since you ain't gonna get your land back we we need you to accept whatever this other thing is and forget about the fact that we gonna continue to take this stuff from you and then 
how did they build up all that wealth on the stolen land through the exploitation of our ancestors and the continued exploitation of us and then other peoples and throughout the world, like it's become this, this uh, you know, international imperial system. But then another thing that comes to mind is a statement by George Jackson. And he said, I now know that the most damaging thing a people in a colonial situation can do is to allow their children to attend any educational system organized by the dominant enemy culture. You feel me? Like that, that one is heavy. Mm-hmm. And so he's saying that because the reality is if we're in their system, we're not going to be learning us. We're not going to be learning a, uh, a real or be, being given the opportunity to have a critical analysis. And I saw somebody in there put critical race theory in the, in the chat, but just the critical analysis of the world, of who we are, of our history, of our culture, our tradition, our potential and power in the present moment. That is so important, you know what I'm saying? And we are denied and deprived that on a daily basis. And then in, instead of even getting some uh, small sample of that, you get this indoctrinated version, like what Hatch was saying, he don't like the S word slavery. I mean, to refer to the system is that, that that is, instead of a, the system of forced enslavement and all these other things, like the affront to our people, our history, our culture, our tradition that we experience on a daily basis is, so- just astronomical, right? So with all of that in in mind, like what we talked about a little bit last week, it's so important for us to be clear on what we have, what we're dealing with, and then look at strategically how we can have an influence on the existing system while what you were saying, building these alternatives, these paths away from what is there. And so there's stuff that does exist and there are so many powerful historical examples that we can learn from and then continue to you know, uh, bring those into the present moment. But we need that. There needs to be a strategy for what is happening right now for our young people that are in school to that, as well as building up those independent institutions that we control that will continue to operate in ways that will feed our young people the ways that we need to, and then provide quality jobs for our community and, and everything else. Like it, then that becomes a, a self-sustaining model in and of itself. So Tyson, so this, let me just really quickly, like my growing up, I went to Catholic school, which I have said before. And most of the teachers that I had at, 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 I went to St. Columba, thank you very much, Alcatraz, North Oakland, all, almost all of the teachers that I encountered at St. Columba were black, including my grandmother, who was the first black lay teacher in Oakland, the Oakland diocese, and my uncle, Shout out to my uncle, Mike, who is still a teacher in Vallejo Unified. Hmm. Um, What I will say to you is what that did for me as a student, it allowed me to move in spaces where then I did not see myself, but it certainly did instill a confidence. However, the very things that you talked about, I didn't, 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 didn't get that from St. Columba. Do you know what I'm saying? So like I, But what it gave me was the confidence to seek my own kind of learning. Like it made me an advocate for myself. That's what it did for me. Um, And I think that we have, there are spaces where that is in fact the case, maybe not with all of everything, all of everything, everything that you said in terms of like the cultural, like the cultural awareness or the cultural competency. Yes, I would agree that that is lacking but we cannot discount that sometimes, not that it's great, but sometimes we need to start at the simplest point, which is how do we how do we give our kids the courage? Or Kamar talked about brave spaces. How do we create those spaces so that they can become advocates for themselves and begin to ask for those things? Because brother, I got to tell you, I am on the other side of this career in education, mm-hmm. right? Like. Yeah. Like, I feel like I might not make it to that mountaintop with you, but I do know that my responsibility at this point is to really work towards with great intentionality around to create the space for you, for for Brother Oaks, Mm -hmm. for Brother Kumar to come in and and do your thing um, in the way that you do it. And so what I'm saying is what Ms. Gayton, Look what Ms. Gayton, what Ms. Cheney did for me at St. Columba was give me the confidence to then 
fight this part of the fight. Because I don't want people thinking like it's it's got to be all or nothing. Unfortunately, it's incremental. We can demand more and we should. But the reality right now is we are dealing with incremental change. Yeah, and yeah. I'm, not, I'm not saying that, right? No, so, no I know you're not. I, I'm, not, I'm, not saying that, I'm not saying that you are. I'm just saying that I think it's, it's like- let's, let's, let's not put that out there because I'm not saying that. So let's no, I, I didn't say that you did. But, but I what I mean, what I, I mean wasn't saying that, that is, at all. No, what, so what I mean by that is it's not uh, one or the other. So what, what I've been saying, and, and I'm not, so what I've been saying is we need to be strategic because the reality, we got, we got to deal with what's real. And what's real mm -hmm. is like if, if we were to pull up some statistics right now and see how many black families or other families of color have their students in public education systems or Catholic schools, charter schools, private, whatever they might be. That, that statistic is going to be extremely high. That's where the majority of our young kids are going. They're going to those institutions. They're not going to these alternative institutions. That doesn't mean that we don't need to be focusing on building up more alternative institutions. We need to do that. But since the reality right now on June 10th, 2021, using this uh, Gregorian Western calendar, you know what I'm saying? In this present moment, we have a lot of families that have their children in these schools. So what can we do strategically to have more of an influence over what's happening in those schools right now while building simultaneously, as you were saying, and as we said last week, more of these alternative educational institutions that we control and that will hopefully serve our young people the ways that we want to see them be served in terms of education support and all of that. So with the present moment, so as an example, right, yesterday I was working with one of my district partners. I work with Eastside Union High School District. What am I working with them on? We're doing a complete redesign of the entire social studies curriculum. So they brought me in as a consultant and I'm working with them to make, to enhance the cultural relevancy in every single social studies class that all those students are gonna experience in that district. When that knowledge and that information becomes more known by parents, community members, why isn't this happening with every single district? And it doesn't have to be me that's doing it, but there are other people who are cultural experts, uh, you know, folks who know information, who can go in there and do that type of work. That stuff should be happening. Why isn't a program like Emoja in every single district around here? When can the I community that? knows about that, we can push on that. And then mental health service providers, whatever the things are. And so that's where, like, as, as we're doing right here, as uh, folks who are participating in this call, especially people who have built things and have these resources, how can we combine those resources and then begin to amplify the power of them throughout these school systems where our young people are? So this stuff becomes more of reality, which allows us to deal with the present while we're building for that future thing that we want to see. So it doesn't have to be either or. We can be strategic about how we deal with now and plan for the future and work on building both of those uh, realities up at the same time. I think where that comes in is the, uh, from our community, right? So the reason that Emoja can't exist at Longfellow is because there was a communal cry, like we need something for our kids, right? We need something that's gonna um, be in your school system that our kids can glean from. Um, and thank God, literally, that Kamar is over this African su American Success Project and that programs like Emoja can be I don't want to say infiltrate, but are integrated into this, you know, system that we say isn't doing what our we need our we need it for our children to do. Um, but I guess my question for you, Brother Oaks, is how do we then, you know, we have it at this one school, how do we get it across the board? How do we get it at the other middle schools? How do we get it at the high school level? How do we start getting this type of curriculum into our even into our elementary schools? And what challenges have you had with that? Or is that even something that we'll be able to see in the Berkeley Unified School System? Yeah, I'll let Mr. Kamar speak more to that. Uh, I'm sure he'll have more information than me on that. But I did want to chime in on this conversation a little bit in terms of uh, thinking about how we, we got to figure out a way to, 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 to get on code. Uh, as we're navigating these uh, institutional spaces. And so uh, somebody put in the chat, I think it was Sister Vicky, she put in the chat, you know, Saturday school. She also said something about um, how other communities do things. And it was something that we've always done too, in terms of, yeah, we got school, but we also had Saturday school. We had park and rec. We had 
uh, you know, our, our religious institutions and places we can go and meet and continue these conversations, continue literacy, even though we're not in, um, you know, the Western education system. And so uh, I think once we come together as a collective and we are on code and we know everybody can kind of understand what the need is, I think we vaguely know what the need is. But in terms of us being on code with that need, I think we would, you know, pressure the city or the cities or whatever, wherever we're at to, you know, put certain programs in, in the play for us to be able to, uh, you know, continue on um, with, you know, our needs with, with literacy. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, I had an echo. Um, that was me. I was, I'll wait. No, go ahead. I can hold it. Go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, I mean, just to try to tie up what Brother Amir was saying and Brother Oaks was saying and what Chris was saying. I think the decolonial language is important. I mean, you know, I'm going to say this is going to be unpopular and it's always been unpopular, but black folk, we're colonized people, right? If you don't believe me, then why are you speaking English? Um, so let me go on anyway, but I think it's like the S word, right? Right. If you don't decolonize your language and work at it every day, every moment, there's things that sneak in that you're not aware of. I don't say slavery. I think it's a stupid word, right? Anybody who knows me knows I say kidnap, torture, murder, rape. <laughs> It eliminates a whole bunch of BS that people try to bring to the bear because colonizers like to say that colonialism was good for the colonized and the colonizer. Yeah, we raped you. We murdered some of your people. But now your situation is so much better than it would have been hmm. had you been left to your own ends. Well, that's not true. Right. And my, our oldest daughter was asked a question by somebody. Well, there had to be a good plantation owner. Right. See, that's the slavery word that allows that semantic conversation to be had. But if it's kidnap, murder, torture, rape, there had to be a good rapist, right? There had to be a good murderer, right? There had to be a good torturer, right? See, now th the story that we're telling is on par. And I'll finish with one of the best quotes I've heard in the last three years was, to be an American is to forget the past in order to accept a historical myth. Right. I got nothing after that. But if we as black. OK, I'll say this. If we as black people don't hold tight to these ideas when we go into these spaces where people are telling you stuff like, no, there were some good plantation owners. I've got this guy, Bob. Bob was great. Bob gave gave the people on his plantation jello. <laughs> yeah, Bob, Bob, ain't, Bob, ain't, Bob ain't never been great. Um, but <laughs> yellow like of all the things you could come up with. <laughs> to, to respond to uh, to that uh, that question by Shantae in terms of uh, when when you have a seed, how do you uh, how do you nurture and grow that seed? Uh, in particular, if it seems like it's going to uh, have some um, some value for our community, uh, I, I think one uh, we do have to be on code and recognize what's a good seed and what's a bad seed because everything that's brought alone and said it's a good seed ain't something that should be watered. So I think we got to start there. But secondly, once you think that the soil is right and that seed should be nurtured and developed. We as people have to protect those things so that those individuals who are working in those systems can maintain and stay there and do the good work. And what I mean by that is, is that individuals, Dr. Greg Carr says this, and I'm not sure if it's original to him, right, or if he got it from somewhere else. But he says individuals don't be institutions. Right. Mm -hmm. I, as a person, can't do that as an individual. I'm the only brother with that title in Berkeley Unified African-American Success Program Manager. Right. I'm the only one in there. So I get to talking and I get to doing things. I'm by myself. Right now, when the community is behind me and they're, they're saying we want this and we want him to do it, then we got it. Right. And so as an individual, I can't fight the institution. I need us as a community in the spirit of emoji. I call it emoji for a reason. And that spirit of common unity, as Brother Oak says, of us coming together. I need y'all to fight with me and I'll be there on the front lines and be able to do it. But I got to have some backing. So I want to say that and address that. Now, I do know that the producer of the show, uh, Dr. Charles Code, has been uh, in the background listening. Uh, and he he hadn't perhaps intended on, on actually joining the show. But I, I just can't go to this next segment around agency without asking the brother to come in uh, and join this part of the conversation. But before I do that, uh, he and I are, are in this uh, this book club together. And one of the books that we read, I actually got this title from uh, Hatcher, it's called uh, Force and Freedom, right? And it's about, it's about uh, the Civil War and how uh, we begin uh, to think about uh, the abolitionist movement and, and our freedom. And then we got to a point where we said, wait a minute, we gotta own that conversation. and We gotta control that. And there's a quote in here right before chapter three. And the, the title of the chapter is From Prayers to Pistols, right? And he says uh, in it, he says, the struggle for progress. 
Uh, and it's a quote by Frederick Douglass who says, I pray for 20 years, but receive no answers until I pray with my legs. I pray for 20 years, but receive no answers until I pray with my legs. Brother was on the plantation with that S word. Right. And he decided one day I'm walking. Right. And so we have been walking. We've walked in the past. And I want to bring in, perhaps, if we can, um, all of us to, to this, right, um, as we close this last section now, thinking about exosystems. Uh, our community has a longstanding tradition of solving the problems that we face. Uh, the community has been a great resource and strength for us. Uh, it would serve us well to consider the ways that we can use community, right, to improve literacy with the end goal of liberation in mind. Another book, Education of Blacks in the South, we talked about that, right? It gives some clues. Right out of slavery, what was we doing? We did it on our own. Right. We did the Saturday schools and those things like that because we knew that we had to play a sub game and supplement. So I want to think about the power of institutions, the power of community building as we pivot to this next section and talk about um, how powerful that is. But before we do that, I want to bring in, if we can, uh, if the brother will indulge us for a, a bit, because this is his work uh, that's deeply tied. I can't really see him right now, but I, I, I would bet I bet. I bet everything I have that he's going to have some type of shirt, a pair from it alone that's talking about agency. So I would like to bring uh, our super, super exec executive producer, but my good friend, Dr. Charles Cole, into the conversation to talk about what do we need to do as a community to get back to building our own, protecting our own for the end goal of liberation for our students, our families and our communities. Uh, Dr. Cole, you back there somewhere? Can we bring you out? I'm here, man. Can you hear me? Uh, peace, brother. We can hear you. That's what's up, man. First off, I just want to say y'all look beautiful, man. All of y'all look amazing the hatchers i love i love hearing them talk together is great uh mama chantel i don't know you but i want to know you so bad man and uh you know what i'm saying tyson i know we don't necessarily know each other but i know we know of each other i definitely own black boy poems and just all that work man and uh y'all had me hyped uh when y'all was talking about meso systems so systems like i you know i talk about that stuff in my book so um brother thank you for having me come on i'm just i'm just proud of y'all and uh just even start off before we jump into it, uh, we we do for self, and I do normally have the agency one on, but this okay. one says my love language is self determination. But um, but part of that is just kind of doing right, not being afraid to fail. I mean, y'all name so much stuff, and you know, part of what white supremacy does, and just like you know, y'all was talking about a lot of things, and I think a lot of people think of the United States as a democracy, sure, which it is, but this is an empire, and if you understand empire talk then you understand power will never concede itself. So if we talk in empire talk, the goal ain't to necessarily educate your kids. Empire talk is indoctrination. That's why you see pictures of yearbooks with young Native American kids in one picture. And then in the next picture, uh, you see them in a suit. Um, and so we're one of the only people on this in this country, on this planet, that hand their kids over to the people that are present them every single day and expect things to be different. You know, they'll take things that we want and say, hey, we want fair and equal. We want to make sure our schools are, 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 are get the same stuff. We don't need your help on the teacher stuff. We got a thriving community of black educators. And then you get Brown versus Board that takes a bunch of cases. A lot of people don't know that it's an amalgamation of cases and not just one. And then they use that to fire and permanently damage like our teaching core. And now that that's why you have less than 2% of black. Mm -hmm. Like things happen for a reason and empires don't just fall into place. There's plenty. And uh, when we read, Blacks in the South, you know what I'm saying? There were things in Blacks in the South, firsthand documents that said, if we allow these Negroes to start learning, if we allow them to have schools, if we lose this free labor, we will have to go to a multi, we will have to go to a global market. This wasn't something that was done on accident. I just mm -hmm. came in running my damn mouth. Come on, take, <laughs> take control, host. I'm just happy to be here. <laughs> Man, I love you, man. Thanks for bringing that energy on this uh, on this on this final uh, on on the final topic at hand. And appreciate everybody that's sticking around. We we went to triple overtime last time. We going to triple overtime again. We fired up. We getting into heated discussions, but that's what we supposed to do. We can't. It ain't gonna be easy, right? If we don't talk about the difficult conversations that we need to have, we ain't gonna get there. So let's get there mm -hmm. together and let's uh, let's continue to rock for a couple more minutes. But I I want to know and, and think about that. I'm I'm actually. Uh, really curious and carrying on what was talked about by uh, by Tyson. He closed this out last time thinking about if we follow the breadcrumbs, but not only follow the breadcrumbs, which is something that we are told to do, but to follow and be intentional about the linkages between uh, one generation and the next, one individual and the next. What are some uh, organizations, some institutions in the past, present, and what are we want to dream about our institutions in the future 
uh, for what we need to do. Right. I, I think about um, how we came together on a publishing front before and said, well, if the books ain't representative of us, let's get in a room together and write something. Right. And thinking about those publishing institutions, maybe what are we seeing in terms of playing a sub game of institution building that's out there, either in the past that we can borrow from. Right. Or what do you want to see in the future that we can dream about in order to make that a flourishing? So can I can I lay the, the just a little bit of groundwork on this one before we have this conversation? Yeah, absolutely. I've been noticing lately that bothers me. I'm not going to get all into it, but if you're talking about Pan-Africanism or Black nationalism, where they intersect, Black unity. Right? They have different Tell me beliefs, more. But, so what I mean is I see now that there's a lot of schisms being created between Black males and Black females, um, Black people in this camp, Black people in that camp, um, Black people calling each other coons on the internet. I mean, this is like... You get to believe what you get to believe. The sister told me once when I was younger, maybe the most revolutionary thing you'll ever get to do is be nice to another black person. Okay. Right. And I don't understand how it is that if somebody expresses an opinion or an idea about how something should be, we get to tear them down just because we don't agree. Right. It would be better just to listen and understand what they're talking about so that we can work together because you can't work together if you isolate somebody by calling them names and treating them like crap. So I just feel like, and it happens really often now, if you pay attention to the space that especially younger black people are in, right? Yeah. And so I just want to be clear that we should always be working to create linkages between ourselves in every conversation. We shouldn't be working to isolate other people, even the people we don't agree with. And that's, that goes back to being on call. Go ahead, Shantae. I saw you about to jump in. Um, well, something that uh, Miss Christine said last week that, you know, it, back in the day, it took a tribe. I feel like it still takes a tribe. Um, I feel like sometimes we just ain't tribing. <laughs> we, we tear, I, I agree, we, we tear each other down. How can you think that way? How can you think that way? We're back in the day, it was like, oh, you black, we black, we, we tribing. And um, I don't know where that got lost. Um, we spend a lot of time tearing down each other, right? each other's ideals, or this is unpopular, fighting one another. I mean, I was at the park with my, <laughs> with my kid and I saw some little girls picking on another little girl. They're all black, group of little girls picking on one little girl. And I was like, come on, little queens, we don't do that. And she was like, if you don't shut up, I'm gonna get my mama and she gonna whoop your ass. And I was like, oh, right. watch the <laughs> girls. I was, you know, so I was like, go get her, get your grandmama, get your auntie, get your grandma. <laughs> just joking. Um, <laughs> I'm laying hands, laying hands is never good unless you're in church. Um, try Jesus, don't try me. But I feel like we spend a lot of time um, doing that to one another. And I think if we could just collectively come together and work on some solutions or like, you know, Kamara said, you know, we don't have this textbook, let's write it. Uh, we don't have that program, let's write it. We don't have what our kids need in these school systems. Let's get together and see what we can do. Let's band together um, with something that's already there. Let's water the seeds that are already there. I feel like we'd get a lot further. But maybe that's the design, right? If we if we have been if we have been indoctrinated to believe there's only so much there's only so much available to a a particular number, like a set number, then we do. We we're like crabs in a barrel. We're fighting, we're fighting for what we believe are crumbs because that is what someone has said. Like if you consider the notion that you have one group of people who said to another group of people, you're going to be our labor and that actually be the case for hundreds of years and then work to, to make sure that you don't have rights and that you don't have access just because they said so, because we're still talking about in 2020, 2021 an anti-lynching law. We're still talking about the Voting Rights Act. I mean, I think, I guess, you know, what I was thinking earlier was, I never saw myself as not having access because of the experience that I had. So to, to learn about my history or to learn about the origins of things wasn't a driving force for me because I was living in a history, right? I had a bunch of black people who were literate black people who held me to very high standards, who had expectations. I never, I never considered once that I was gonna fail at anything. That was never, that was never a mindset for me. Right. And so to leave that space and go into some other space where they did not have my care and concern, my care and concern was not foremost, forced me then to do that very thing. Well, like, wait a minute. 
clearly I need to like I need to know some other stuff. I need I need to I need to educate myself. And so that was the benefit. That's that let me know that I have to advocate for myself. I wouldn't have been in that space had I not been in sake in that space of St. Columba first, but then in other spaces that I occupied. And so I guess that's what I and so I, you know, it's like I've I've come to be a learner about my history. I came to the party late, but I didn't know. I didn't know that I was going to have to. I thought I was at the party. You know what right. I mean? Like I got what I was. I was. I was fed. I was being fed, and it wasn't until I got to a place where, wait a minute, you don't have anything for me. Okay, then I then I need to make my own way. Yeah, and I think that that is uh, the the beauty. I, I know that uh, you know we I've seen a lot in the chat uh, guerrilla literacy, uh, right? Insurgents. I'm I'm hearing all, but that is the benefit in starting students off early, even if it's supplement towards a sub game of right. You go into class, but you got this one class over here that's just introducing you to a different perspective, which goes back to what uh, Hatcher has framed as some of the goals of literacy decision making. And risk awareness is very, very critical. And you might not remember the dates and the facts and all the things that you learn in the Moja. You might not learn who the most significant baseball player was in the Negro Leagues, but you will walk away thinking from that, wait a minute, we, we had our own businesses and that's something that I could accomplish. And then when you're told that you're not, you then have the critical awareness and decision making ability to say, you know what, we can Right. And I have an example of that. And so I think that that is uh, critically important before we um, before we get to uh, final thoughts. Wanted to know if there were uh, any other thoughts on this particular uh, conversation and pinpoint that we're on right now. Mm -hmm. In particular, if there's an opportunity to highlight some historical organizations, some historical institutions that have mm -hmm. been effective. Because, again, if we don't know where to look. If I don't know where to look, I can't get no breadcrumbs. So start mm -hmm. us off. What, what are a couple organizations? We mentioned some the last time uh, and maybe Tyson can bring that up just as a reminder. Right. But what are some of those institutions before we go on the back end of this and close it out that we could be looking at in terms of breadcrumbs that will help us be able to navigate this situation? Well, part, of, part of one I was going to say, Kamar, uh, and just again, I just I love this. I'm just very happy. And I hope that y'all continue to do this show. I hope that this ain't the last one just because y'all are technically done. But um, when y'all said the sub game, right, like part of that. I was thinking about, you know, the invisible institution and, and a lot of people don't know what the invisible institution the invisible institution occurred during slavery times. And it was in church. And basically it was black folks, whether they were in church by themselves or they were in mixed company. They did entire sermons in code, meaning that you were getting both the word, but you were also getting directives around what was going to happen and things of that nature. That legacy. And that's not a group per se. Maybe you can say. Black religious institutions, whether it's, you know, Christian, Muslim, whatever, I, however you feel about that is how you feel. But it's, it was a strong institution where a lot of things has happened. It also used to be the center where you would bring teachers, you would bring the district, you would bring uh, the police or all these community folks. And that would be the place where black folks would congregate to work things out because that place had reverence. And it's still, you know, maybe it's waning for some people. But this whole show is from that notion of. I knew if we get really dope black people, there's going to be a lot of code that comes out of here. There's going to be a lot of things spoken. Some people going to get everything and some people not. And mm -hmm. that's OK. You know what I mean? And so when you talk about those institutions, uh, Kamar, the one thing that I was thinking about, and you know this because you know me well. I remember when I, I used to want to travel out the country a long time man, and I was waiting on the homies. I got my bread. The homies said they want to come. The homies said they want to come. And then. The homies don't ever come and you don't get to go to Paris like you wanted to go. And then until you just go. And I think that with this, you just sometimes you got to start with not all the information, with not all the confidence. You just got to start taking those steps and then you will get the right people to like come together. I do believe in that kind of divine order. And I'll just I'll just close my comment because you got some brilliant people that's way smarter and way more elegant than me. But I would sum up your whole conversation in this way. It's a lot of people that use a lot of terms that they don't know what they're talking about, but they saw it on Twitter and they want to feel smart. I think it's a lot of people that got doctor titles that make I almost curse. I curse a lot, y'all. It's my <laughs> network, though, so I can curse on it. But they, they, it's a lot of people, right, that that want to sound smarter. So you have to pay them so you can keep them around. 
And I think that if you are a black person who has a doctorate, your job is to make complicated things simple and accessible for your people. And if you're not doing that, I think you're a waste of space. With that being said, y'all whole conversation was so dope because people use the term social justice a lot. And I'd be like, all right, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, white person. What that mean? <laughs> mm -hmm. Explain it to me like I'm like I'm like I'm 11 years old. What does it mean? Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that y'all actually exhibited today and I broke it down. I said, let me you don't know. So let me tell you how I break this down for young people. A N D. It's awareness. It's navigation and it's duty. Mm. Y'all are doing the awareness part. You got to know where you come from. It's hard to do what the sister Chantel said. Chante, I'm sorry, I don't want to mess up your name. It's hard to do what the sister Chante said because Chris did a good job of explaining, right? It's crumbs at the bottom of that. And black people actually do think about their survival on a daily basis when a lot of other people don't. So even though I live in, I grew up in North Oakland, I lived in Chicago, I am always aware of, I love black people to death. And I know exactly where the hell I'm at all the time because mm -hmm. I'm not dumb, right? Navigation, You, we got these schools and I need y'all to know, school, school ain't education and education ain't a building. Meaning the schoolhouse is not your only vestibule for education. And when you have kids on code and uh, Brother Oaks said that I actually have a piece coming out, it's called Black Kids on Code. And it's based mm -hmm. off this study around these black girls out of NOI who went to this school and rejected everything they had, but they stuck together on code and had the highest grades and could pick any college they wanted to go because they were on code. They knew that they wasn't gonna get their self-worth and well-being from that place, but this place is a key that can open doors and unlock gates and then can put your people on, right? And then the last piece is the tough one, and but it's hard, but you gotta stick with it because if you don't do it, the whole thing falls apart and it's duty. What is my sense of duty to my person, right? So I grew up teaching, learning A through G on my own and that's something I'm passionate about, but I wanted to be, but I can pull my homie that play on the team with me and be like, hey, bro, get your, let, bring your transcript. Let's look at it together because you obviously ain't getting what you need. I knew I wanted to do this with Kamar one day when we was in my car yep. and a song by Griselda came on yep. uh, called Guys Don't Bleed. And we broke down uh, um, Benny the Butcher's verse in it, right? That's literacy. It's like so much code in there. I, I, I should have been like, yo, I need y'all for 20, 30 episodes. No, 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 man. Here, let's do this the, the right way so you don't have to scramble and do these things so you can bring on. I wouldn't, I ain't got access to these people. I ain't got access to these beautiful people. So I know I, I've overstayed my welcome. I'm going to shut up. But I wanted people to take that. It's awareness, navigation, and do. Are you able to do those three things? And it's okay if you're not able to do everything, but find somebody that can make sure all three are happening at the same time. And y'all are a blessing to me, man. So I'm going to shut up. I won't say nothing else. But thank y'all for letting me be here and crash with y'all a bit. Nice. Hey man, when, nice. as you were, as you were talking, uh, you know, talking about being on code, sometimes we talk a lot with our, with our bodies and body language. And I, I, I seen our brother Oaks hit you with the Arsenio a bunch of times. <laughs> that, means, <laughs> that means that you was on point, brother. Um, Appreciate I, it. I wonder, uh, as we, um, as we transition to, to final thoughts, um, I, I would like to give everyone uh, an opportunity, mm -hmm. one, to address the institutional let, me, let me jump in. Yep. Let me jump in, please, because um, I think like you were talking about the historical examples. We can we can list those, and that might be something that would be a great thing for us to do as a follow up, so mm -hmm. folks can be more aware of the the historical institutions and traditions and the things that our people have done, and then be able to see how those things are still having an impact today. Like in many ways, those those are traditions that are being carried on with. The, the work that people are doing. But I think the real piece, and especially based on what, you know, Dr. Cole was just saying, like, I, when, when you were asking that question, I went to, there's the theoretical understanding of something, but then when we're really talking about knowledge, you can tell that somebody understands or knows something because they're able to do it. So, and, and that goes back to what Dr. Cole was saying, you, whether you're getting it from, from social media or from books you're reading or you know, documentaries and talks that you've watched and people are saying these terms and now you regurgitating these terms. Do you know how to do it? So for us, I think that's the next phase that we need to get into. And, and, I, and, and I wanted to, to take the lead on this part of the conversation because I want to challenge us to do that. We all who are on this call and in folks who are in the chat and, and other folks that we know, I think it's extremely important for us to come together and begin to assess the resources that we have within our community and like we can we could do this like we could literally focus on 
Many of us are in the East Bay, whether we live in Oakland, Berkeley, Hayward, wherever we at, right? We could focus on a city and we can say, let's see all the resources that we have here. And let's begin to compile those resources and then use them strategically to build up the independent stuff and then to put more pressure on the existing educational systems that are there to try to create the changes that we want to see. That's possible. Like we have the ability to do that. And if we do that, that's something that can be a model. And then it becomes a historic model that can be replicated in other places. And there are folks who are doing, I mean, in Chicago, they're trying to do work like that. In Atlanta, they're doing stuff like that. In Philadelphia, we know that they're doing stuff like that. You know what I'm saying? We got some folks that we know in New York that are trying to make moves like that. But for real, we have the ability and the capacity and going back, like I ain't from, I ain't from the town. You from me? I'm from San Jose. I'm from the east side of San Jose and be, being born and raised in the Bay Area and being part of this culture is extremely important. I, well, the reason why I wanted to say that was not to, you know, saying set trip on nobody. But <laughs> like, what we do here in the Bay is felt throughout the world mm -hmm. and especially what happens in Oakland. You feel me? Like the things that happen here, Oakland, East Bay, Bay Area in general are felt throughout the world. So if we are able to do that, come together, y'all, like for real, let's talk. Let's see what we got. You know what I'm saying? Energy converters is moving. What y'all got here with this, this this podcast, this is moving. What some other folks are doing, we got some people that are moving. How can we combine those efforts and then think strategically on using these things to have that impact on what's going on right now? So summer for the, our students going into the next school year and then also building more of these alternative independent uh, institutions that we control. Uh, we can do it. Mm -hmm. And that's where that power is at. So, and, I, I, and that's why I think that the, the duration of your program being three, four episodes, whatever it is, that's great. Because now we got work to do. Mm -hmm. You can come back, you feel me? But like we need to get to that doing part more. And I think there's a lot that we can do who are on this call, other folks that we know. Let's bring them in. Let's talk and let's see what we can do and let's see what we can make happen. Right on. Thank you, bro. And uh, for it's hard to do final thoughts because you're like, who do you call first? Because you don't want to, <laughs> right? Uh, but don't don't leave me hanging, y'all. When you with your final thoughts, why don't we just uh, step up to the plate and uh, you Hatcher and I close it out? But brother Oaks, go ahead. I see you leaning in. Yeah, because I think the brothers uh, are saying some 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 really important things. Um, you know, I I think about um, you know we we mentioned um, you know institutions, historical institutions that we can lean on, but I think about what they did uh, without naming any names. You know, any institution we could think about in the historical past they all practice something that we got to get back to and, and, and brother uh, Tyson just alluded to it and that's cooperation we got to stop trying to compete with one another in terms of whatever it is we're doing and we have to find a way to get in co-ops again uh, and what better time than now obviously uh, this was you know we were in co-ops before uh, integration happened uh, it was out of necessity, but here we are. We find ourselves in a very uh, critical moment in time, um, and it 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 kind of speaks to the need for us to get back into these co-ops and figure out ways to to move as a unit. And that's why the code piece is so important because once we you know you know get together as a co-op, then it it changes the perspective behind why we do what we do. Um, and one other thing that I don't think we mentioned too much, but I, but I definitely think we got to consider, especially if we're thinking about literacy and education, is this digital piece uh, and the positives of it, but also the negatives of it. And how mm -hmm. if we want to get back in these books and we want to begin to, you know, utilize what our you know forefathers use, uh, this 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 system that this technology that's in place is is highly addictive, and our young people. Are masters at it, but they're masters at it from an a entertainment perspective. And so uh, these are things that we got to consider and we have to put into the, the formula of coming to uh, our liberation and literacy is how do we navigate this thing here and, and, and find a way to set this to the side, even with its addiction and everything, for our young people to find a space to, to practice the traditional way of doing literacy. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Can I um can we pivot for final thoughts to uh to Shantae? I'm, I'm looking at the clock and I'm like, I know them babies gotta eat. So um can we uh can we have some final thoughts? You've you've participated and watched uh, another and have been heavily involved in this, and I appreciate your presence. What are some thoughts overall with the with the series and maybe some thoughts about this evening that are coming up for you? 
You mute it. Just kidding. Um, I think from a parent perspective, um, there were a few things that Hatcher said last week. One was don't abandon your kids to the school system. Um, so that's out the teachers that you know are capable of giving your child what they need. Um, but also find your tribe, find your tribe. Um, we're stronger together. Uh, you see a seed is being planted. That's a good seed, like Kamara said. Rally, rally to water it and rally to keep it watered um, in any way you can. Thank you. Um, can I go to Christine? <laughs> I don't want to confuse the Chris's. Um, um, my, my, my final thoughts, my takeaways. Um, I think in the, in the last three, last, you know, previous two conversations and takeaway from this conversation is how do I continue to, to integrate, you know, my learning into the experiences of the kids, I, kids and families that I serve, as well as, you know, my own children. Um, like, how do, how do I do that? Jamidra was teasing me about taking notes because I write down things that, you know, really resonate with me. Um, I felt like especially the conversation last week was super powerful because, and I was telling this to Hatcher, I said, it was like being given, a, 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 I was peeking on a conversation between men, male educators, to your point, which doesn't happen very often. You don't actually see a lot of black men sitting around talking about education. Um, and it was just fascinating to me. And I, I I had my head down for most of it. I was like, okay, this is cool. Like, how am I going to, how do I bring this back into what I do? How do I bring this back into what I do in a meaningful way? So the, a lot of takeaways for me, like just a kind of a reframing. Um, I appreciate the invitation. Um, I, you know, there are lots of ways I guess I could have spent a Thursday at, uh, you know, what, six o'clock, um, six to eight ish. Um, but this was good. And I've taken as much away from, from these past three weeks as folks who have ha been watching. So, um, thank you. We will, I will continue. I will continue to fight to create those spaces. So as you younger people with far more energy than I have at this stage in my career um, can come in and really affect the change that I believe is, is necessary. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you. We, we ready for the baton. I'm ready for it. <laughs> I, um, I'm ready, and I'm ready to give it, brother. That, that is the truth. <laughs> Hatcher, thoughts? Sir, I have two. See, I was ready this time. And I'm not going to answer the question I wish you had asked. I'm actually going to ask, answer the question you asked. <laughs> I say that every time, Mike. <laughs> every time Kamar asks you a question, you go, I wish you had asked this question. Because I got a lot to say. No, I think I, my two things, one, humility. Um, and what I mean by that is Claude Anderson, I think, in Poweronomics, mm -hmm. talked about this idea of meritorious manumission. Um, and it's kind of resonating with me. Meritorious manumission was the idea that if on the plantation you found out somebody else was about to run away and you told on them, they would free you knowing mm -hmm. that anybody who would snitch, is that the right word? Tell on somebody else who was going to leave, didn't want to leave themselves, right? But my point in that is we have to work together. And in working together, there is a sense of humility. Like I could say this with all honesty, I love all y'all. And I have some deep-seated beliefs about how things should be done. But humility says, if you come to me, like Brother Cole comes to me, Dr. Cole comes to me and says, hey, I'm working on X. Or if Brother Oaks comes to me and says, I'm working on X. Or if Chris comes to me and says, I'm working on X and I need you to do Y, I'm going to try to do Y to the best of my ability. I'm not going to be like, oh, brother, I think you need to do blah, blah, blah. Or, oh, sister, I think you need to do blah, blah, blah. Because I don't know, if I had the solution, this country wouldn't look like this. I got to be honest. <laughs> it would have it changed a long time ago. So <laughs> the best I can do is support you in what you're trying to do, right? That's the first thing. And, and I got to support you to the best of what you're trying to do to the best of my ability. And I always try to do that for people when they come to me, like, we're trying to do this. Okay, what can I do to help you? 
right? I'm not going to say, I don't think you should do that. How would I know? I'm just one guy. The other thing, though, that I think we can do that we need to pay really close attention to is historically black colleges and universities. Mm -hmm. Right. They have over a century of experience getting outcomes for black people and people overlook that. Right. Came up in the most tumultuous of times and got outcomes. Morehouse, you know, many stars in the HBC universe. There's only one son. Um, Morehouse, <laughs> the son. <laughs> when the sun comes out, the stars fade away. Just had to say that to finish up. Um, Morehouse has dedicated themselves to changing the conditions of black people. That's their mission. How do we make the world better for black folk? That's the mission of the college. Spelman right across the street, same thing. And, and, and people look at those colleges and say, that's not for me. I don't know any other place that wouldn't be for you more than that. And so, but, and I don't mean like study it so you could go there. That would be great. But I mean, study these schools, see what they've done and see how they did it. What do they believe needs to be done to get outcomes? And I think if we do that, we could replicate whatever school it is. I don't care, you know, it could be Tuskegee, FAM, Howard, Hampton, um, North Carolina a t whichever one, just pick one and learn what it does and what its history is and why it's so successful at what it does, because you can replicate that in your life. That's it. That's my final thought. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually not going to take the final thought. I'm going to put that pressure on the esteemed Dr. Cole. Oh, out. Sure. Um, okay. But, but uh, I, I do want to I do want to say um, that uh, that car conversation that that we had that Dr. Cole talks about it was after coming from uh, Marcus Books. We we went there and we had a conversation. I picked up a copy of his book. I said, "How does my boy produce this wonderful book?" And I've never read it before. All right, so I picked it up and and I, and I read it. Uh, and we've been doing a lot of talking. And Shantae says something that above and beyond tonight and over the course of the three resonates with me is to build the tribe. And I know that in part, it's an interesting conversation. And in part, it's an opportunity to come and be on a live stream. But it's also in part to do what Hatcher just said. A lot of you came because of myself. A lot of you came because of Hatcher. Some of you I've never met before, right? And because of that, you came together and said, well, if y'all about black children and doing something real, I'll be there, right? And I don't take that for granted. I don't take my relationship with Dr. Cole for granted, right? And in a different, kind of scenario he said he looks up to me right well what i'm going to say is is that it's reciprocal right and he put the battery in my back to say brother you got to get out there because you got something to say and he's pushing us to say hey don't don't end that three don't worry we're not ending that three we're just taking the pause right this is a, a thank quick, you it's just a, it's just a quick pilot right and we're gonna regroup and we're gonna come back right with, with fire um we're gonna come back ready to do the work and put it in and i want to say that we're not experts Right. But we're willing to be vulnerable in public. Right. And to test these things out in hopes of finding a solution. And with that said, I would like to pass it to, as I say, our triple OG executive producer, Dr. Charles. <laughs> Damn, triple OG. Triple OG. I was, I was hitting Jamija like, why put that brother on the full screen? Not me. I look crazy right now. But thank you for that, man. Um, again, I just thank all of you. I think y'all are all brilliant and I learned from each of you and we need each of you. And also the people that's watching, we need you. We need you to keep commenting. But more importantly, if you took something from this, like blog about it, write about it. If you got your own blog, post it. Uh, if you need help, just find me. I'll edit it. I'll post it for you and do whatever needs to happen. Um, and what I'll do is I will buy three of Amir's book. Uh, I, yeah, I'll, I'll buy three of Tyson's books and send it to you. Uh, after the three, though, you just got to deal with my free version of my uh, of my audio book. I can send you the code for the audio book, brother. But um, but we need you all to kind of get this message out. And we want to know what you took from it. Right. Because, again, education is only as good as the people that that, that translated to you. Right. So, like, I want to know what kind of stuck out. I guess the last thing that I would just say, man, is um, all of y'all are special and you got to know who you are. These, these, these systems will have you second guessing yourself, thinking you ugly, thinking you're not smart, and then they will flip it. They will flip your hair. They will flip your, 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 your lips. These lips got made fun of for a long time ago. Now every white girl got 10K to get some fat lips now, right? <laughs> like, I'm just saying, right? Like, and some of y'all got some daughters with some little fat lips that's worried about it and feeling some kind of way. We got to know who we are. And uh, Tyson said this earlier. If you got a story to tell, the biggest way that we have always transmitted information is through is oral tradition. Um, that's it. That's how we do it. Tell your story. Do not stop telling your stories. Um, I think it's the most important thing that we can do is sharing those stories because you find a piece of yourself. I, Kamar knows this. I, I was born 
I grew up in Oakland, but I was born in Chicago. I grew up in the exact same neighborhood as Fred Hampton Jr. And well, Fred Hampton and, and, and Fred Hampton Jr. and I have been working together. But this is one thing that he said to me recently, and I'm gonna share with this, and this is how I'm gonna end it. We need to be working together and do the best we can, but the fact that somebody else ain't doing what they need to do does not excuse you from not moving forward and keep taking those steps. And what Chairman Fred Hampton Jr. said to me just recently was that all black folks didn't want slavery to end. Some just wanted to be able to hold a whip. Mm. And so I'm gonna just say that, man, and, and, and I am just so grateful for all of you. Y'all are brilliant. Y'all are Michael, Tyson, Christine, Christopher, Kamar, and Shantae. Y'all are beautiful, like amazing, beautiful people that didn't have to do this. And, uh, and I hope you all go follow them if you are here because you, you mess with the stuff that I produce or you mess with eight black hands or whatever the case is, go follow each and every one of these people um, and, and, and make sure that you are showing that support. Um, and I'm just so, so proud of Kamar and Michael and my apologies. This is my first time, you know, extended to somebody and not being a part of it. So I know there might've been times where I was too involved. There might've been times where I wasn't involved enough. I can't worry about that, right? Let's get this, let's do the best we can and we'll get better as we go. We'll get better as we go. And so I'll just say, um, I'll just say that piece. And Kamar, do what you got to do, brother. God bless all of y'all. Now, in between, and in between this time and next time, keep your head up, right? Stay strong, and we'll be back at y'all. Peace and blessings, y'all. Good night. Thank you all.